Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Maker's Testing Tactics webinar series. Today's topic is understanding and interpreting the time domain reflectometer traces for cable fault location. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the digital marketing analyst for Megger. I'll be acting as a moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see control panel that looks similar to this one. Uh, you can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted there in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, your certificate of attendance, copy of presentation, and link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is Glenn Wall, Applications Engineer. To assist with the question and answer session, we will have joining us Jason Aaron, Applications Engineer, and Joseph Aguirre, Applications Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining in today, Glenn. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is, as Michael said, Glenn Wall. I'm an applications engineer for Megger out of the technical support group. Um, for today's agenda for this webinar, we're going to be discussing the time domain reflectometer. And for the agenda, we're going to go over some topics. Uh, what is a TDR and what are its applications? Uh, how does it work? We're going to cover some of the common misconceptions as well as some of the capabilities and limitations of a TDR. We're going to go over some of the parameters when we're actually performing this testing as far as cable velocity, pulse width, and pulse amplitude. Um, and then we're going to go through some example traces. So let's get started with what is a TDR. So a TDR is a time domain reflectometer. That means it, uh, it's a, a reflection meter that works in the time domain. It's also called a radar or cable radar commonly. It transmits a high frequency pulse uh, onto a test specimen, and then it measures the reflective waveforms uh, from, from various uh, discontinuities in the insulation. So what the machine does is it transmits that pulse, measures the return, and calculates a distance based on the time between those two events. They typically operate in a 10 to 30 volt range or 10 to 50 volt range, um, but there are some higher voltage models out there. The most important thing to remember for uh, any TDR application is that it does require two complete conductors in parallel to function. So as far as the devices go where we can see these, there's a couple different styles. We have uh, integrated devices, we have standalone devices for use on primary and secondary power cables, and we have handheld devices that are commonly used on telecommunication cables. So here we have some examples. This would be an example of an integrated device. This is our Smart Thump 16. Um, here's a standalone device uh, for uh, primary power cables. This is a Teleflex. These are commonly used on overhead and underground distribution cables. And then this would be an example of a handheld device that would be used on telecommunication. So the focus of this presentation is going to be the integrated and the standalone models. So some of the applications where we commonly find this kind of testing is underground power cables, it's very common. Uh, Subsea cables such as transatlantic cables, um, overhead, overhead uh, um, distribution and transmission lines, uh, telecom cable and signaling cable. And uh, what we use these for is to uh, find distance measurements, fault locations and illegal taps. So some of the signatures that we commonly see, uh, let's get started with a bump up. So this is the cable baseline for the impedance. And when we see a bump up like that, that's usually indicative of an open conductor. Uh, and that can be for a couple different reasons. It can either be the far end of that cable, it could be a broken conductor, or it could be a broken concentric neutral, whether that's from damage or um, potentially if it was corroded away due to say an unjacketed cable system. We could also see a bump down. We can see these for a couple different reasons. Uh, it could be uh, essentially it's a, a lowering of the impedance at that point. And that can mean either the conductor is grounded on that far end uh, or it could be shorted to the uh, concentric neutral or tape shield. Um, this often occurs in digging locations. So maybe someone with an excavator uh, dug up a piece of line. Now that concentric neutral is making metal on metal contact with the uh, center conductor. 
Um, it could be the arc location too, if we're using a, an, an integrated uh, cable fault locating device, such as a smart thumb, which allows us to uh, produce a short at that location. That reflected signal is going to appear as this red line, and we'll go over that in a minute. Uh, it can also sh uh, show us taps on that bump down. And then uh, the last signature that we're going to go over is a, is a wiggle form. Um, that is indicative of a splice or a transformer. So here's an example trace. Most TDRs, uh, after you've connected and you have uh, performed that pulse to output, we're going to get something that looks uh, something along the lines of this. Uh, it can vary differently depending on the overall impedance changes within that cable. Um, and depending on what the unit is, it's going to display some information. But essentially what we want to see is something along the lines of this. Uh, on the left edge, this is the near end of the cable. So this is where our test set is hooked up. Um, at the right end, we're going to see the, uh, hopefully, the end of the cable where it's either stood off or parked. And then this is the distance measured in cable feet from that TDR to the end of the conductor. Um, it is important to know that that distance is measured in cable feet, uh, meaning um, it's not necessarily the linear distance between the two points. So if I am measuring a cable that is between two different switches or transformers, it isn't the distance uh, linearly uh, along the ground because as we know, cable is not always necessarily installed in a linear uh, direction. It, it might take a convoluted path to get there, whether that's from the nature of the environment or obstacles, something along those lines, or maybe they just had some extra cable and they've buried a loop. So the TDR is going to give us the cable feet distance. This indicates the strength of the reflected signal. Uh, this is our amplitude. That's our connection point to the cable under test. And that bump up at the end is the indication of an open. So on this cable, we would assume that the cable is parked on the other end uh, on a parking stab or uh, open air. When we are marking these waveforms with a cursor, we want to make sure that we are always on that left edge of that reflection of that signal um, because that's where that disturbance starts. On this trace, we can see that there are five transformer signatures. We've got one here. We've got the bump up and the bump down, another bump up and bump down, so on and so forth, uh, that we can identify. So when we're looking at an example trace, uh, we can see it in a couple different ways. So here we have one in a normal condition that we would expect if we have the cable isolated with that open at the far end. Uh, we have another one where it has been shorted or grounded at the far end. And we can overlay them and see uh, the results of both of those. TDR is commonly used to find uh, pinhole faults on integrated units with a uh, surge pulse generator. Um, this is called an arc reflection method. Um, pinhole faults are the most common defect on extruded medium voltage cables, and we would normally characterize these as higher resistance faults, typically over a thousand ohms. Um, they'll have a higher breakdown voltage. Um, on these, uh, a center conductor is continuous, and it's not in contact with a concentric neutral, um, but it has a resistance that's high enough to where a TDR alone and by itself isn't going to find it. So now we're going to get into how does it work, um, some of the common misconceptions. So the reflection, what is that? Uh, essentially, it's a pulse that's been reflected off of discontinuities within the cable. So some of the terms that we're going to use are ZO and ZT. Um, ZO being the characteristic impedance of the cable, and ZT is the impedance at the termination or discontinuity. So ZO is just the normal impedance characteristic of that specific cable. And then ZT is anything outside of that uh, normal impedance. Um, what it does is it creates a return. It reflects some of that pulse, um, which is proportional to the change of the impedance. And what it does is it 
essentially creates this effect. This is the pulse traveling through the cable. It hits this impedance change, this discontinuity, and some of the energy is reflected back at the TDR. The rest of the energy continues on. So what do we mean by that? If we view this as a discontinuity at a transformer, here we have our transformer. Uh, this is the cable coming in, going to a load break elbow on a feed through bushing or pass through bushing, and then the cable coming out. And this is our concentric neutral shields that are coming off and are bonded to the grounding system. So when we send the pulse down that cable, it goes through the cable, through that pass through bushing, and then back out. And now what we're going to see is we have this large degree of separation between the center conductor and the concentric neutral or tape shield braid at that point. So if it's if it's measuring that impedance between the center conductor and that braid, as that distance increases, the impedance increases. So, uh, and then as it uh, as they begin to come back together, we show a decrease in impedance. And that gives us that wiggle uh, waveform, that uh, signature that we see on the TDR trace. We see that separation and then where it comes back together and where it balances back out at the end. Uh, splices do something si similar um, because it's measuring that impedance, the distance between the conductors at a splice um, if this is our cable and this is our splice location, uh, we will typically have that concentric neutral cut back um, and we will run that braid over the buildup that gets installed after we have done the crimped on uh, splice connection. And so that distance increases between the concentric neutral at that point and the center conductor. So we have that increase followed by a decrease of impedance. It's just measuring the impedance change from the increase in the distance, and that gives us a similar waveform. But because it's not as extreme as a transformer, that signature on the trace is going to look smaller than the transformer. So the reflection theory, um, as we can see it here, uh, first we establish an impedance baseline for that cable. Um, in an ideal world, a perfect cable would have zero impedance, it would have zero resistance. Um, and so uh, we would establish that baseline as a zero and anything, any change, positive or negative, outside of that um, would cause uh, some reflection that would be bounced back at the unit. So if we look at the, uh, the baseline impedance of that cable, and then we start to see reflections, any small amount of impedance change, whether it's positive or negative, is going to reflect a certain amount of that pulse signal back to the unit. And we can see small amounts of impedance change cause large amounts of reflection to the point to where uh, eventually 100% um, of that signal is going to be returned to the unit. Um, but since it's not a perfect world, we know that uh, no cable is a perfect ins has perfect insulation, um, just like no conductor is a perfect conductor. So if we give that initial impedance a, a value of 50, um, we can establish our baseline is going to fall somewhere on that positive range. Um, and some cables tend to have higher losses, uh, whether that's cable construction or uh, a large number of splices. So we have our baseline impedance, um, and then we've got a range for what will reflect, uh, what will cause uh, reflection up until we get 100% reflection. And that range is not incredibly large. So what does this mean? Essentially, it means that open circuits are gonna have infinite impedance to the unit. Uh, anything that has a value that's very much greater or lower, well, anything that's greater than um, that Z0, that ZO, uh, we're going to end up getting 100% positive reflection pretty quick. So open circuits give us that bump up signature. Uh, if we think about it linearly, um, 
that signal is going to travel through every impedance change in that cable, whether that's damages, uh, splices, transformers, terminations, or voids, um, and those reflected signals are going to be received and graphed by the TDR. And that graph that's created is essentially a map of impedance changes within that cable. So conversely to an open circuit, a short circuit has an impedance of zero. Um, and we will get a 100% negative reflection at a short, and that's that bump down. Um, and all other disturbances are going to be between those two values. So the height of that wave is determined by the amount of impedance change that we have and how much signal is going to be reflected. So some common misconceptions. The pulse doesn't travel down the conductor and return on the neutral. Um, the pulse travels down the cable and it's reflected off of discontinuities within that cable. Uh, another one is uh, that a TDR pulse um, can't travel through transformers. Some people think that you have to disconnect the transformers. Um, they don't need to be isolated uh, to perform TDR testing. The pulse won't travel through the core due to inductive reactance. Another one, uh, some people think that uh, TDR can be used as a troubleshooting tool to find uh, faulted transformers, and it's really not designed for that. Um, it doesn't work for that application. Um, so a circuit that has transformers in it that has faulted, um, if the TDR uh, or an integrated TDR on a cable fault locating piece of equipment um, cannot find the fault on a cable run, the fault might be at the transformer. The TDR is not going to be able to detect that. So what's a good model to think of this as? Uh, if we think of it like a train leaving the station, um, uh, this is a pretty good analogy because a train requires two tracks. TDR requires two parallel paths. If one rail is missing, if one of those tracks is missing, uh, the train has to stop. It can't proceed any further. Um, and it will need to return back to the station. So the the pulse, if we think of it as a train, it will travel down the track until it runs out of either both or one of the tracks, and then it is going to bounce off of it. Essentially, uh, the pulse has to stop and return back to where it came from. So let's think about unjacketed cables with corroded neutrals. So typically when we're doing TDR uh, testing on a cable, when we are doing unjacketed cables that have corroded neutrals, as that is as far as that pulse is going to travel to that point where that concentric neutral is completely corroded away. Now, if the concentric isn't completely corroded away, uh, we'll still see the signal going through it. But if we have a true breakdown of that concentric neutral at one location, um, that's at the end of the line for that signal. It is going to get a 100% reflection at that point. It doesn't work on uh, single conductors. Like we said, we need that, um, we need those parallel paths. Uh, we can't see past a break or a short in a cable, so if a cable has been uh, dug into or damaged in some way, um, or if that center conductor had a fault and it blew apart, which is fairly common on aluminum conductors, uh, that's as far as that TDR is going to be able to see. Uh, we're always going to have some limitation on range, even though our uh, the range on these units is uh, typically pretty good. Um, some of the bigger units can get up to around 600 kilometers uh, for effective visibility. Uh, but it cannot find a pinhole fault by itself. So we need an integrated unit, or we need a unit that works in conjunction with a surge pulse generator in order to find pinhole faults. They're also difficult to use on circuits that have branched um, conductors. So anywhere where there are taps, um, it's going to be difficult because now we have multiple parallel paths that that signal would have to go on. So it's much easier to interpret the traces that we that we see from uh, in the results of this unit uh, when it is one single um, circuit that we are checking with no taps. So now we're going to talk about cable attenuation. Um, as the cable length increases, we're going to lose some of our energy, and that's just due to insulation losses. Uh, if we look at this graph, uh, the longer that the cable is, 
the uh, the more signal strength we're going to lose, the more energy we're going to lose from that pulse, uh, and it's going to result in a lower signal for us. Um, what that does is it tends to make those uh, reflections smaller and shorter, uh, and it can be difficult to interpret them. Uh, and the longer the cables are, uh, the more splices or transformers there are, the more impedance changes and discontinuities there are, the higher those losses are gonna be, and the more pronounced that effect is going to get. Uh, another aspect of this uh, that's similar to the attenuation is cable dispersion. So as a cable length increases, uh, the pulse, which will start as this very sharp uh, signal, um, on a very long cable run, that pulse will tend to flatten out and get wider. Um, it's not necessarily losing energy. The, the amount of energy that's there is still going to be the same, minus whatever gets reflected. Um, but it does tend to stretch out and get lower. It's similar to attenuation. And the reason for this is just because cables tend to filter out um, the high frequency component of this and draw it out. So they're difficult to separate from each other, attenuation and dispersion. Uh, and most people just talk about them like they're the same thing. So let's look at some of the trace parameters. So cable velocity or propagation velocity or velocity of propagation. There's a couple different terms depending on uh, what unit it is, uh, but they all mean the same thing. And what it is is the measurement of uh, how fast the pulse travels down and back on the cable. Now, it is electricity. The assumption is that it would travel at the speed of light, but it's uh, not exactly true because depending on the construction of the cable, um, uh, the, who the manufacturer was, what type of insulation it is, uh, it can change the speed with which that pulse signal can travel down and back on that cable. So if I'm driving a car and I drive it for three hours, how did I? How far did I drive? Well, in order to know that, I'm gonna need um, a couple different uh, factors. I need to know how fast I was driving, or I can make assumptions about it based on what kind of roads that I'm on. If I'm driving on surface roads or in, in a neighborhood, I could assume if I'm in, um, a uh, small town in America. If I'm dry, I would assume on surface roads, I'm probably driving approximately 25 to 30 miles per hour. Um, whereas if I know I was on a highway the entire time, maybe my speed was 75 miles an hour. So you, we can make guesses um, depending on either knowing how fast I was going or what kind of roads I was on. And power cables are the same way. So most medium voltage direct buried cables uh, fall somewhere in a range of about 240 to 280 feet per microsecond. Um, and it's about 40 to 60 percent of the speed of light. Larger cables, because there's more room for the signal to bounce around in, um, typically have a slower velocity. Um, it can be measured in feet or meters per microsecond or percentage of the speed of light. Uh, but it's essentially just like miles an hour. Um, and an important thing to know is that TDRs uh, account for the return trip because that pulse has to originate from the TDR, travel through the cable to the point of 100% reflection, and then travel back. And so the TDR already accounts for the return trip on that calculation. So we can see, this is a slight example of it, um, just simplistic. Uh, the larger the cable is, the longer it's going to take for it to come back um, as compared to a narrower cable, a smaller um, cable of the same length. And that's reflected here. Um, so this larger cable might have uh, a cable velocity of 235 feet per microsecond, whereas the smaller one might have a cable velocity of 255 feet per microsecond. So what this means for us is how it appears on the TDR. Here we have the same cable that has been examined three times at three different velocities. And if we look at it, we can see three different interpretations 
of that same cable at different distances. So here is our connection point to this cable, and then we have this transformer, this transformer, this transformer, this transformer, this transformer, or this might be a splice. And what we have is none of them are at the same distance, and that is just because the machine is calculating that distance based off three different numbers. The closer it is, so here we have 256 feet, and here we have 567 feet, and here we have 878 feet, so on and so forth. The further out we get, the larger that discrepancy gets. So here we've got a distance of 130 feet, 143, and 156 feet for the same uh, for the same uh, discontinuity for the same probably transformer. Um, but out here, so here we have a difference, we'll say between these first two of seven feet. When we get out here, we've got a, dis a difference of a lot more, 78 feet. Uh, Yes, a difference, a difference of 78 feet. So seven feet, 78 feet of difference. That is a much larger number, make it much more difficult to find. So uh, the longer the cable is, the more important uh, that propagation velocity, that uh, cable velocity will get. Um, a good resource for that is if you do have a way to know the exact distance of that cable from drawings uh, to use as kind of a baseline, that can be helpful. Uh, phase comparison can help. Um, otherwise, uh, if you can get the foot markers off of the cable from one end and the other, and uh, if that uh, works, uh, if it uh, typically would have to be off of one run of conductor, uh, you can use that and adjust that velocity factor until the distance uh, at the end of the cable uh, shows appropriately. Otherwise, if none of that's available, um, if you can get the manufacturer's information as well as the information off of the cable, uh, you can probably call the manufacturer and they should be able to give you uh, what their estimation of that uh, cable velocity should be. So now let's talk about pulse width and blindness. Uh, so pulse width is essentially how long the unit is going to hold that signal for. So it act, excuse me, uh, it activates the pulse, and how long it holds it before it shuts off um, determines the pulse width. And what that can show us, um, why we would want to use this, is because we can have a certain amount of blindness. Um, the closer a discontinuity is to the unit. So if we have a ship and a submarine, the ship is going to use a radar and send a signal down to detect a distance to that submarine. Uh, as long as that ship is far away, it has time to originate that signal, send it down through that water, bounce off of the reflected signal, um, or reflect a signal off of that submarine, and return to the ship, and then it can calculate it. However, if that submarine is so close that the ship is still transmitting that signal when the reflection is bounced back, the unit's not going to be able to see it. I'll do that one more time. So it's still originating that pulse. It isn't even done outputting by the time that that signal is already starting to reflect. And here is an example of that on a trace. So it's the same thing with cables. If our pulse width, here we have three different, it's the same cable, three different pulse widths. We have a 30 nanosecond, a 100 nanosecond, and a 500 nanosecond pulse width. So with the 30 nanosecond in red, we can see we have a very good uh, depiction of this initial um, uh, discontinuity. And we can kind of zoom in and see it. Uh, same thing with the 100 nanosecond. So the pulse was small enough, it was narrow enough uh, that it could see this. The unit initiated and stopped and was able to see the return. But on the 500 nanosecond pulse width, we can see that we are blind to that very close discontinuity and the next one. 
we barely got a little blip here and we can see how exaggerated they are on the other pulse widths. So increasing the pulse width emits more energy onto the cable. It just makes sense because we're holding it for longer. So why would we want to use it if we can see closer things with the shorter pulse width? Well, the wider pulse width, the longer it's held, the more energy it has, the further away it can see. Um, but as I said, it's going to suffer from more blindness, especially in the beginning. Um, and th this becomes important um, to help overcome uh, long cables or high loss cables. You know, if I've got if I've got 10 kilometers of cable. I'm going to have to use a larger pulse width most, most likely. Or if I have a cable that has a lot of splices or transformers in it, I might have a bunch of losses that I'm going to need to overcome. And the pulse width can help overcome some of those um, losses. So it increases the distance between two points that can be distinguished. Um, so if you have a bunch of splices closer together, um, say within you know 10 to 50 feet of each other potentially um, and it can change depending on the style of TDR and the pulse width options that are available um, if they are very close together if you have two splices within you know 10 15 feet of each other the TDR is not going to be able to distinguish the two it will see a uh, discontinuity will get reflected signal but it's not going to be able to interpret um, those two separate discontinuities with any degree of real accuracy so two splices within a certain distance uh, can appear as just one um, wiggle signature so let's talk about pulse amplitude the pulse amplitude is the voltage of that pulse uh, being transmitted by the TDR. A uh, higher pulse uh, amplitude creates a larger signal, uh, which in turn creates a larger reflection because it has more energy. Uh, and a higher pulse can travel further. So there's not truly a downside in increasing pulse amplitude other than oversaturation. Um, and it can make the TDR uh, just slower to operate because it has more information that it has to process. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by uh, saturation shortly. Um, not all units have that same option to uh, change pulse amplitude. Um, a lot of the handheld ones don't. Um, here we have the same cable at three different pulse amplitudes. So we have 10 volts, we have a 30 volt, and we have a 50 volt pulse. So oversaturation, um, if we, uh, if this particular cable and our uh, gain was set in such a way, uh, we might not be able to see the top or the bottom of these uh, signatures. Um, it's just been oversaturated. Um, this is our largest amplitude is on the blue. And you can see that the peaks are very tall, very sharp. And then the lower the amplitude, uh, the, the smaller they are. Um, and so if we have a waveform that is very difficult to interpret because it looks like a bunch of hodgepodge garbage um, and we can't distinguish between anything so we could possibly change the pulse amplitude um, in order to see that if it's just oversaturated we can also adjust the gain to help um, calm some of that down too so range um, our visible range uh, uh, should be scaled for the cable under test. So it always originates at the zero foot marker and then our range on some units uh, has, it has an automatic range feature that can um, scale it for the cable based on where it perceives the end is if it automatically detects and drops a cursor at the end of the cable. Um, so this is an example of an improperly scaled range because we can see the end of our cable is here and then we have all of this dead space afterwards. Um, we can see that the end of the cable, uh, the machine has identified it at 997 feet. However, our, our cable range here is 8,407 feet. Obviously, we would want to change that uh, because it will make the trace easier to see. Um, 
So here it is uh, properly scaled. All right, so now our visible range is 1,147 feet. And this is much easier to see. This is much easier to identify some of these uh, signatures. Um, and we want to get that uh, the open end of that cable or the end of that cable uh, on, as far to the right edge of that screen as we can to give us the most to give us the, the greatest advantage for interpreting this trace. Gain is another thing that can be adjusted in uh, uh, most units. Um, here we have an improperly adjusted gain. We can see that this signal is very saturated. It's very difficult to interpret like this. And we have a clipping effect um, at the top and bottoms of these uh, trace signatures. And then here we have it adjusted. So we can scale that gain until we can see a waveform that we like that is going to allow us to interpret what is actually going on with this cable. Um, ideally, what we would like to see is no clipping um, and about 50% uh, between the top and the bottom and the top of the amplitude scale. So some units have what we would call pro range. This is a distance dependent amplitude correction or dynamic gain. And what this does is because of um, that signal attenuation, because of those losses and that signal, that pulse losing energy as it hits these discontinuities, um, our signal strength goes down over time. So our signal uh, may start uh, nice and sharp and then as it hits discontinuities, it's going to attenuate and it's going to lengthen and it's going to flatten uh, until eventually we run out of signal that uh, can be reflected back to the unit or we hit the end of the cable. Uh, and so with gain, what we do is we are adjusting that um, to increase the sensitivity of the unit um, to these uh, reflected signals, to these uh, signatures on the trace. And we can make them easier to see. What the dynamic gain does is it adjusts it over time, over distance, um, to give us the maximum amount of signal to where these reflected uh, signatures have the same um, signal strength that we want in order to interpret. So if we are looking at the beginning of the cable, the gain might start off relatively low. And as we get on towards the end of the cable on very large cable runs, uh, that gain will get turned up over the course of the trace. Here we've got an example of the same cable with deattenuation on and deattenuation off. So in red, we can see we can see uh, the length of this cable, and this cable is a little over four kilometers long, uh, 4.09 kilometers. And we can see this nice, sharp uh, increase in impedance, this, this open end of the conductor. It's very easy to identify. With the deattenuation off, we can see that end of the cable is much more subdued. So this is not just a, 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 a gain in ramp. It's not just, oh, this cable is X amount of feet long. I'm going to increase the gain, you know, one step for every, you know, 100 feet. It's, it's not quite how it works. It's exponential de-attenuation. So it's truly looking at the attenuation of those signals and adjusting it as needed. So for the summary on the parameters, for all the little factors that affect those traces, uh, cable velocity is the speed of the pulse, which is going to uh, affect the accuracy of the calculation of those distance measurements. So what the machine is going to use as the, uh, as the factor for calculating that actual distance. The pulse width is how long that pulse is sustained uh, when the unit initiates it. It's how long it's going to take to emit. And it affect it affects it can affect the blindness of that uh, uh, reflective signal and the overall max distance of the trace. And <clears throat> excuse me, uh, pulse amplitude, the height of the pulse, which is really just the voltage, the amount of voltage that that pulse is being sent out at, and that also is going to affect the max distance, but can oversaturate the trace. And we have range and gain. Uh, range is the scale that the TDR is looking at in distance, the maximum distance. And the gain is the scale of that vertical axis. 
So now we're going to look at some uh, some example traces. We're going to go into the phase comparison. We're going to look at some arc reflection, and we're going to look at some sectionalizing. So a phase comparison is measuring two or three different phases, or, or potentially more, uh, trying to see a difference between them. Um, this only works if you have a cable that has two or more conductors. Um, so what we'll do is we have two different cables and we want to overlap them and compare one to the other. So if I have, like it says here, a medium voltage uh, uh, distribution cable that's approximately 900 feet long and I've got uh, two or three cables uh, all together, um, I can shoot them individually and then compare them to see how they, because they should be functionally similar. Uh, they should, when I overlap them, show all the same um, characteristic impedance changes uh, at these locations. If that cable, if those same cable runs go through four or five transformers, I would expect to see four or five transformers, uh, depending on the cable, um, on each of them. So if I have three phases, in the same trench, all feeding the same uh, connections, um, I would expect them to have similar traces that would mirror each other. And what we can see here is on the blue cable, if I know that uh, the, the distance is supposed to be uh, 907 feet, I can compare the other phases, and I can see this one shows an open at a different distance. All three phases might have uh, different open connections uh, or open locations. That's not, um, that, that shouldn't ever happen, um, but uh, there are situations where someone could make that happen. Um, phase comparison on a high voltage transmission cable. So this is about a 60,000 feet uh, long run, and all three phases on the far end are grounded. So here we have it with the red phase ungrounded. All grounded, red phase ungrounded. So we can be certain that this is the end of the cable. This is the shorted end. All three phases are grounded on the end, meaning they are shorted. So we see that downward deflection from that negative impedance change. And when one is ungrounded and it flips up, we know that we are seeing all the way through to the end of that cable. So we can see that there is a large uh, impedance change on this green phase, uh, indicating that there is an open. Here is an overhead line TDR result for a 500 kV line that is 190 kilometers. So we've got three phases there, um, and what we can see with this, uh, it, interestingly, if we look at this, we can see some things. So here we have, the um, this is the propagation velocity. So the unit is transmitting it, and it's calculating it based on 148.8 meters per microsecond. We can see our width, our impulse width. Uh, it is uh, 2,000 nanoseconds. Our amplitude on this unit was 160 volts. The pro range, that dynamic gain, was at 95%, and the gain is currently set to two decibels. So what we see is the grounded end of the cable. We see the second transposition there, and the first transposition. So these can be difficult to filter in order to identify from one uh, from one set of cables to another. It can be difficult to read TDR traces, and that's something that comes with uh, practice and a good understanding of how they work. Here is our Smart Thumb 16, and these are kind of the standard um, cable connections when using an integrated unit for, with a surge pulse generator. So we would want, if we're using a surge pulse generator, uh, obviously we want to have the uh, equipment ground connected, uh, but the, the TDR is integrated into this specific unit. On some, it's a standalone device that has connections to the surge pulse generator, but then we will have an output cable, high voltage output cable, whoops, 
a high voltage output cable, which uh, will be connected to the center conductor, and the high voltage return, which is going to be connected to that concentric neutral or shield braid that is going to the ground rod. And we leave the far end of that, uh, the far end braid of that concentric neutral grounded. Uh, practically, we want to use single point grounding. Um, so if we are connected at a transformer or if we're connected at a switch, uh, we would like this equipment ground. It is important that that is connected to the same ground as the specimen under test. And here we have uh, the TDR trace and kind of what it does. So this, this is standalone TDR and it's connected the same way. We've got our high voltage output connected to the center conductor, the return going to the shield, and the shield is grounded. So the TDR is going to um, put on that low voltage pulse. It's going to release that pulse. It's going to travel down to the end of the cable, bounce off and come back and we get this reflected waveform. So this particular cable does not uh, does have a fault. It has a pinhole fault, which is that high resistance fault. The TDR by itself cannot see a pinhole fault. It does not have the voltage in order to overcome the resistance of that fault. And this is what it would look like on a real trace. So we can see the open end, we can see the beginning. Uh, we can see this is probably a splice here because we have this slight wiggle signature, but we don't see that uh, impedance change for the pinhole fault. So as I was saying, to see the short, uh, to see the short um, and verify the end of a cable, um, it, what we can do is we can uh, apply uh, from that ground. We can short that center conductor on the far end to the concentric neutral ground. And what that does is on a unit that does a live trace, um, we can see in real time that deflection from the upward to the downward. Now, if the unit doesn't have a live trace function, meaning it pulses every second or so, um, what we can do is just reinitiate the pulse, uh, just redo the test um, after you have that end grounded, and you should see this uh, change between the flip up and the flip down. Um, and what this tells us is that we are seeing all the way to the end of that cable like we assumed that we were. If we don't see that, well, then that means that uh, we have a, a missing railroad track somewhere. We either have um, some concentric neutral that has been damaged or the center conductor is not intact or potentially the guy with the uh, shorting strap on the other side of that cable uh, shorted the wrong cable. So when we have that missing track, when we don't have the two continuous parallel conductors, the signal is only going to travel to that large impedance change and we're going to get that 100% reflection. It is blind past that point. We have to have the two parallel conductors. And how do we identify that situation? Um, so if you have unjacketed cable, um, one option is uh, if you know that this cable is 500 feet long, and we'll say the TDR is only showing 200 feet, uh, you can always make these connections on the other end and shoot it backwards and see if you make up the remaining distance. Um, and and show that 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 additional missing cable, um, and and then you can kind of rectify that. Um, but ultimately, uh, that should be repaired. So, how do we find pinhole faults, which are the most common faults on medium voltage uh, direct buried cable? Um, we use the arc reflection method. This is the industry standard for fault location on primary power cables. And what it does is it's a combination of a low voltage TDR pulse and a high voltage pulse from a surge pulse generator. It's a two-step process. So initially, when we've connected the unit, um, we've done you know, a, a, a breakdown test, an insulation resistance test, or a breakdown test of that cable to verify that it's faulted, and we get that uh, um, breakdown voltage level. And then the unit should, 
uh, and the operator should initiate a TDR trace to get a fingerprint of the cable. And this is what we would want to see. Now we're going to assume we already did a breakdown test of this cable and this is our fingerprint of it. So we see the open end. Then we are going to use a high voltage pulse to create a temporary short at that pinhole fault location. So what this does is the thumper is going to uh, apply a high voltage pulse that is going to bridge the gap between the center conductor and the concentric neutral or shield. And it is going to create a temporary short, a, an actual arc. The TDR is going to send out another low voltage pulse that is timed with the high voltage pulse. And that low voltage pulse from the TDR reflects 100% because now we have a short between the center conductor and the concentric neutral. And that second low voltage pulse is just going to have 100% reflection, negative reflection and bounce back. Um, and then that is, that is what's going to be shown on the screen using the arc reflection method. So this isn't, this red line is not a graphing of that high voltage pulse. This is a graph, this is a graphing of that second TDR pulse that was timed to bounce off of that high voltage arc. So a couple things with this, it is important, we have to know what the breakdown voltage of that fault is, because if we can't create that arc, then there is not going to be that short circuit path for the low voltage TDR pulse to tr to reflect off. There isn't. We aren't going to create that impedance change. Um, there are challenges with that. Sometimes faults have a low resistance um, in that they won't allow us to sustain an arc and create that path, um, and it just bleeds the current off to that concentric neutral. Um, so if we don't get a good strong breakdown on that fault, um, we are not going to be able to uh, get a good strong signature back from that um, reflected waveform. So here we have a thumper. Uh, we'll just say this is a smart thump and we've got our high voltage output cable on the center conductor. We've got a return on the shield uh, and we've got this pinhole fault. And so what happens is uh, we've selected the voltage and the, the thumper, the easy thump, smart thump, is going to charge that capacitor up to that voltage that we've selected. And we're gonna select that based off of whatever the breakdown voltage value was of that fault. Right, so we want to exceed the breakdown voltage of that fault uh, location. So the thumper will charge and it is going to send a high, end, a high voltage pulse through the cable. That pulse is going to travel down to the fault location, create an arc, and then that low voltage TDR pulse is going to be reflected off of it back to the unit and give us that overlay. And this is the real world trace as we saw earlier. Um, on our units, they automatically, um, at least with the uh, eTrace software, which is what the graphic user interface for our smart thump, easy thump, and a couple other cable fault locating uh, pieces of test equipment, uh, it will uh, automatically flag, it will identify and drop a cursor and give you a distance to that fault. So anything after the pulse, because Remember, we are getting 100% reflection here. Um, so everything that happens afterwards is not real. So um, anything that happens on this red line after that short, uh, as long as we are getting um, a good uh, short created by that high voltage pulse, anything after that is just an echo from back here. Um, so this is an echo. Uh, this is an echo of this fault, and that is um, go signal that uh, doesn't have any bearing. So, but uh, to keep that in mind, that fault you can only find one fault at a time using this method. So, if you have a cable that has multiple faults in it, you can you will only be able to find them one at a time. So, after you have found this distance and that cable has been repaired or once it gets cut out um, at that bad section, uh, it's a good idea to test it again further down and verify that you don't have any other faults. Or 
once that splice has been repaired, retest the entire cable in order to ensure that the repair was done correctly and that there aren't any other faults on that system. So we do have uh, three general types of faults that we're gonna find. Uh, we have those pinhole faults, which we need the uh, arc reflection method in order to find, uh, and that is an insulation failure. Uh, we can also have opens, um, and we can arc across those um, sometimes, uh, and that's a severed conductor, or uh, it's common on aluminum conductor cables uh, for when there is a, a pinhole fault of severe magnitude, it will actually separate that uh, center conductor, it will burn itself back because the center conductor tends to atomize under fault conditions. Uh, and then we also have a short. Uh, with a short, you do not need any high voltage to find it. The TDR is just going to see the short. So if you connect the TDR to a cable and you see a short in it, and you know that that cable is not shorted, um, it would be a good idea to get that distance and uh, go see what is causing that short. And it could be a bunch of different things. Uh, maybe a, a, a contractor uh, ran, accidentally ran a ground rod through the cable, or a backhoe, like I said, maybe it cut the cable and now that center conductor and the concentric neutral are um, making direct metal on metal contact with each other. So that's the arc reflection method. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about sectionalizing. Uh, sectionalizing is a testing uh, method that's employed uh, usually in power, power restoration. Um, it doesn't uh, employ the, uh, the the pinpointing thump of the typical uh, cable fault locator uh, for the for use in pinpointing the exact location of a cable. Uh, what this is more used for is to identify which section of cable in a circuit uh, is faulted. That way, we can isolate that section and re-energize the rest of that circuit, um, and then repair that uh, isolated section. So uh, cable restoration or uh, cable sectionalizing uh, still uses that arc reflection method. And the goal is to find the fault in one of two ways. Either we are going to use a footage um, and then walk it out, or we are going to look, or we're going to try to identify it between two specific landmarks on that circuit. Uh, and typically what we're gonna use is transformers. So this is sectionalizing visualized. Um, essentially what it's doing is it's giving us that thumbprint and then it is going to identify all of the transformers in that um, circuit. Uh, transformers are switches. And so each of these is a transformer and the unit has automatically identified here's T1, T2, T3, T4, and T5 and drop a cursor and give us a linear distance to each one, a cable foot distance to each location. So on this circuit, we have approximately 900 feet with, of cable with five transformers on it. And we know that this cable has a fault on it and this section is entirely down. So we will use the arc reflection method using that same process. And what it will do is it will give us that trace overlaid with that sectionalizing trace to give us what we would like to see is the two landmarks, in this case, T2 and T3, that that fault is between. So if I was on a cable restoration or a power restoration crew, um, I would use this method and then I would see that between transformers two and three, I have this cable fault and I will go ahead and isolate it and fix it. So here's some of the products that we have. Uh, for the handheld uh, telecom products, we have a TDR 1000, which is a single channel, very nice little unit. And the, and the 2000 series, a couple different models of this, uh, which it ha is a two channel unit for use with phase comparison. And then we have the power products, well, Teleflex single phase, uh, this is the SX single phase. We have the VX, which is a three phase unit. And we've got a simpler MTDR 300, which is also a three phase unit. And then for primary and secondary power cable fault location, we've got uh, SPG40 with a Teleflex. So here we see that Teleflex SX being used with a surge pulse generator. So these are both standalone units that can be used uh, separately or tied together. 
Our newest one is the STX40 uh, with a, it also uses a Teleflex type integrated TDR. And we have the Smart Thump and the Easy Thump series. Uh, we also do have Centrix integrated test van systems, which use uh, uh, we can mount them with uh, several different styles of units. But these are all for primary and secondary cable fault locating. Uh, so with that, that is the end of my presentation, um, and we should be getting ready for questions. Michael, thanks, Glenn. Uh, so, as previously mentioned, the presentation portion of our webinar is officially concluded, and we'll be jumping into our Q&A session here in a second. If you have any questions, please submit them now into the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar control panel. For those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon future webinars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a quote or a demo on any mega products. As a reminder, a copy of this presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of the webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars, as well as register for upcoming webinars on our website at us.mega.com webinars, and register for our webinar on March 18th, titled Transformer Winding Resistance Measurement Field Challenges, presented by Volney Naranjo. All right, let's jump into our questions. The first question I have, I'm going to be directing over to our panelist, Joseph. Joseph, how long does it take a oh, how long does a cable need to be uh, adjusted to the velocity? So I'm reading that wrong. I'm going to take that for a third time. Bear with me. How long does a cable need to be to adjust the velocity? <clears throat> hey, Michael. So on this question, it kind of depends on what's your uh, cable type. So I'm going to assume this is medium voltage cable. So on medium voltage underground cable, what you'll do is typically anywhere about a thousand foot or more would be when you want to adjust it. And usually whenever you have really long runs of cable, you already have an, a brief under, uh, some kind of print or something or understanding of how long the cable is. So what you can do is on a, on a model that does have a live trace, you can go to the end and short the end. So the center conductor to the, to the shield. And as Glenn mentioned in there, you'll have that downward blimp and you can adjust your, your cable length to that end that matches your print. And that'll give you, uh, that'll get you right where you need to be as far as the cable length. Thanks, Joseph. Our next question is over to Jason. Uh, Jason, can TDRs work if the neutral is corroded? Okay, so for this question, we have to understand, um, as Glenn mentioned, uh, you need two parallel conductors to be able to do uh, a TDR trace. And um, if you have a, a corroded uh, concentric neutral, then um, you kind of have to understand what the state of the concentric neutral is. Um, if in some cases, the concentric neutral may not be corroded to a point where it's lost electrical, uh, continuity, so you'd still be able to do those TDR traces. However, if um, the corrosion of the neutral is so bad that um, maybe it's open at a point of 500 feet, then you're only going to be able to see a TDR trace up to um, that 500 foot mark. Um, there is um, an alternative approach to doing this, and as I mentioned, and as Glenn mentioned, um, you need two parallel conductors. So. Um, if you have a three-phase system and you have a, cor a corroded concentric neutral, then you can use one of the other conductors in lieu of the concentric neutral to be able to get a good uh, TDR measurement. Thanks, Jason. Uh, back over to Joseph. Uh, can a TDR show a short on a cable? Well, can you hear me? Okay. So, uh, it can show an actual short on the cable, but by a short, it'd be a physical short. So that'd be where the concentric neutral or the shield is physically touching the uh, center conductor of the cable itself. And it should show the, the downward blimp right there showing you that there is an actual short right there. However, if it's not making full contact with that, the TDR would not be able to see that. So if it's just a, uh, a very low resistance fault, 
where it's not uh, completely shorted, but it's not all uh, not a high enough resistance fall, it may not see that. So if it's making a really good contact, yes, you'll be able to see the short. Thanks. Uh, back over to Glenn. Uh, Glenn, can TDR work on underground cable network? So TDRs uh, should work on the first zone before that uh, before that first tap. They're not typically used through networks. Um, like I said, um, it uh, it works best on a straight run of cable. The, with the problem with uh, networks and those branch taps is that um, it tries to uh, put them all together on the same trace, making it very very difficult to actually make any sense of the trace. So you can do one very long continuous run of cable, um, but you do want to isolate any of those branched tapped uh, cables coming off of it first, and then test those individually. Thanks, Glenn. Back over to Jason. Uh, what is the advantage of using a live line TDR such as TDR 2050? Oh, we still might have you muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, I apologize that, uh, folks. Um, I know where. So uh, for our TDR uh, instruments that we have, some of them ha have the ability to do live tracing while others may be a single shot capture of, um, of your TDR trace. And um, the advantages of having a live trace is that you have an active picture of any changes that may take place, um, uh, excuse me, that may take place across the circuit. Um, so what you can do is um, if that TDR trace is active and um, you have questions about the TDR trace, let's just say that the where it identifies the end of the cable at is questionable, uh, you don't agree with what that measurement is. Um, what you can do, as Glenn uh, showed in his presentation, is go to the other end of the cable and uh, short the center conductor to the concentric neutral order of ground reference and uh, be able to identify if it is indeed uh, the end of the cable. Um, what this does is just it allows you to have another tool to be able to help uh, more accurately find the faults in the cable to be able to uh, more accurately and efficiently find the fault uh, without wasting any time. Thanks, Jason. Uh, over to Glenn. For direct buried cable, can you explain the difference between uh, shelf testing and insulation resistance testing, please? Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Um, okay, so the difference between uh, sheath testing and insulation resistance testing on, uh, let's say we're using an integrated unit like the Smart Thump or the Easy Thump. Um, sheath testing is a method used for uh, performing either um, the sheath fault testing um, on the concentric neutral or sheath of that cable, which is a similar process, um, uh, but the same method can be employed to test uh, secondary cables as well. Uh, essentially, uh, what it does is it just limits that maximum voltage output of the unit. Um, because when we're talking about sheath fault, the insulation is actually the uh, the jacketing of that medium voltage cable, which is rated much lower um, voltage level wise than the insulation uh, internal to that medium voltage conductor. And so it uh, essentially is the same, um, and we can even use some of the same testing methods. We have sheath fault um, breakdown testing and sheath fault uh, uh, pin, uh, uh, fault location testing um, that operate in very, very similar manners to the normal operation of that uh, specific test set um, as far as arc reflection, and, or, well, not arc reflection, but as far as the uh, insulation breakdown and the, uh, and the thumping goes. Um, but it is not going to let you do an arc reflection test and it is uh, I think I'm getting a little bit sidetracked on that, um, but no, there, there's 
uh, functionally the only difference between insulation resistance testing and the sheath testing, or we'll say breakdown testing and sheath testing, is the maximum output voltage that the unit is going to allow you to put out uh, when it's in sheath testing mode. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, Jason, can you provide details or caveats on how to handle transmission cable installations with different bonding uh, schemes? Okay, so your the configuration of your grounds on your cable is uh, will influence or affect the TDR uh, trace. Um, whether you have single point grounding or possibly cross bonds on the system, um, you have to understand that as uh, Glenn mentioned, uh, you have the two parallel conductors that you're using for the test. And if, so if the um, the continuity of the grounding uh, circuit or the concentric neutral is not um, consistent uh, all the way through that circuit, then it's going to affect the trace. This may be the case if you have single point grounding or cross bonds that uh, cross bonded grounding uh, at splice points or whatnot along the cable. So what you can do for this is uh, for if you have a um, uh, let's just say for uh, cross bonds, for example, for cross bonding, uh, what you can do is go to uh, the end of the cable run, so uh, three-phase system, and you can uh, apply a temporary uh, grounding jumper to all three uh, concentric neutrals at the end of the cable. And what that will do is equalize the potential of all of the grounds in the system um, to allow you to be able to get an effective trace. Um, whenever you do do this, though, um, you need to make sure that uh, when you're doing your TDR traces that you're using, that you're testing on one cable at a time, because essentially what you've done is tied all of your grounds together. So um, if um, if you're trying to do say a, a um, the two phase the t uh, two conductor method, then with two uh, different phases, then um, you're going to have to uh, reconfigure the system whenever you do the TDR trace. Um, and as far as the single point grounding, again, if um, if you have single point of grounding at every splice point of the cable, then you're going to have to apply temporary jumpers to make that continuity on the concentric neutral through the entire circuit to be able to um, have an effective TDR trace. Thanks for that. Uh, back over to Glenn for our next question. Is the TDR destructive? So the the short answer is no, not 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 really. Um, the the voltage on most TDRs is uh, generally very very low. Um, as I said, you, excuse me, it's usually somewhere between 10 and 50 volts. Um, there are some higher voltage uh, models, uh, but one thing to keep in mind is when you are doing the arc reflection method. Um, and, and even that is not typically destructive, but I will say it can be dangerous uh, when a medium voltage pulse is is then also applied. Um, so all all applicable safety uh, measures should be taken when dealing with any of the higher voltage uh, test steps uh, on this uh, in this procedure. And if you're using a TDR that can exceed that uh, that touch safe uh, voltage recommendation or re recommend requirement um, by NFPA, uh, we need to follow whatever the uh, applicable safety standards are. But no, the, the TDR itself is not considered a, um, a destructive test. All right, thanks. Next is over to Jason. Uh, and that question is, uh, is VP uh, related to aging of the cable? How much is it for the XLPE usually? And sorry, I messed up that unit of measure. Oh no, Michael, you're good. Um, so this question is in relation to the propagation velocity um, of the cable. And if the the aging uh, of, of a cable um, could affect that. Um, generally, I would say uh, no. Um, typically, the um, the propagation velocity is in relation to the insulation medium and the cross section of the cable. So um, this this can be different um, whether you have XLP, EPR, uh, PILT cables, for example, um, or uh, if you have um, a small cable that might be um, 
a one aught cable or if you have a cable that's 750 MCM. Um, so, uh, but those are the, the characteristics that affect the propagation velocity the most is the cross section of the cable and the insulation material of that cable. Um, there is a cable list within most of our TDRs that you can refer to uh, to be able to help find the closest propagation velocity, but in some cases, um, it may not be exact. Um, so it's a good idea to know um, what the propagation velocity may be for the cables that you're trying to test before you start testing to be able to verify that you're using the correct propagation velocity. All right, thanks. Uh, back over to Joe. Uh, we've had some issues with trace finding at the end of a conductor in underground residential systems that have had multiple transformers connected to the run. The system prompts us to manually move the cursor to the end of the line. Is there a way to adjust the settings to fix this? All right, so that's a really good question that uh, a lot of people actually have. So the, the short answer is, uh not really so uh what that means is if it, there is a very long cable run and then you have multiple transformers on that section that as glenn was talking about in the presentation how you some of that signal reflects back through all those splices and transformers so you're losing some of the signal as the way it goes through and the software has an auto detecting feature for the end of the cable run and since you you're stretching that signal out you're not getting as as high amplitude as you normally would to signal the end of the cable. So the software itself is having a hard time to recognize where the actual cable end is. And instead of just guessing and cutting off some of it, it's asking you as a user to kind of determine of where that end is. Thanks, Jim. Uh, over to Glenn. Uh, how is the uh, VOP, I think we might have we use that as a unit of measure as well. How is the VOP determined for different cables and do the TDRs calculate this for you? Um, yeah, we, we, we have talked a lot about propagation velocity and it is a, it is a difficult question to answer um, because it is different for every cable um, and uh, it can vary based on size of the cable, the insulation type, the the, the type of conductor, um, the manufacturer, whether it was made on a Tuesday. Um, so the, like I said, uh, the the propagation velocity. If you if you pick up a, a a TDR, it's going to have a value there that is calculating off of. And so for us, we default to 255 feet per microsecond. Um, because we found that that is a good um, middle of the road option for most medium voltage direct buried cables. Um, and, and on sh relatively short runs, we'll say less than a thousand feet or so, um, that is close enough to um, then continue with uh, more precise uh, location methods, uh, usually pinpointing. Um, so the uh, the TDR is not going to calculate this. It doesn't really have uh, a way to calculate that. It is just going to calculate it based off what it is set. Um, for the, be the best method to use is to know the distance of the cable and then adjust that propagation velocity until that end marker is at that correct distance. Um, now, that should be done by someone who's well familiar with TDR technology. Um, if you if you cannot find that distance, if you don't know the approximate distance of that cable or the exact distance of that cable, like I said, the 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 best method to use in that event is to contact the cable manufacturer uh, and get in touch with their engineering department or try to get an answer from them as to what the propagation velocity should be for that specific style of cable. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, so next is over to Joe. Is there a standardized table which provides propagation velocities for different cable sizes and voltage ratings? So Glenn kind of uh, hit on this a little bit and so did Jason a couple of times. So the, the 255 is pretty much standardized as far as a, a, a general good rule of thumb of whatever the, the cable size is for that medium voltage cable. 
it'll get you in a roundabout ways of where you need to go. And of course, as I discussed earlier, adjusting it above a thousand foot needs to be adjusted. So there's not one standard because different manufacturers, as Glenn was saying, and uh, different factors go into play as far as the, the propagation velocity goes. But in our E-Tray product software, we do provide a cable list, which is a good roundabout number for your propagation velocity for XLPE, EPR, uh, uh, a couple of pelks are in there, and it does give you different uh, voltage ranges as far as 15, 25, 35 kV cables and different uh, Amer American wire gauge sizes. Thanks, Joe. Uh, back over to Glenn. It has been several years since I've been involved with this and the technology has changed. Once you find the location of open or short and you go to dig, we used to find that with a high velo with a high frequency device and listen to find more specifically where to dig by listening for that. Is this still done the same way? Um, so there, I'll say yes and no. Um, so once we have found that approximate location, uh, especially if we're using the arc reflection method, it's going to get us close. Um, we still do pinpointing. We still do the thumping um, in order to do the pinpointing uh procedures afterwards um, but the technology has advanced you know we used to use just uh, you know two spiked audio inputs uh, with a pair of headphones and a little receiver box that would kind of let us know which direction we needed to travel down the cable path um, and uh, that that method is still employed um, but uh, we also have much more advanced um, uh, pinpointing devices available um, I would definitely recommend uh, looking into our um, um, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Of course, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, um, our, uh, uh, our, we have a pinpointing device that the name is slipping my mind for some reason. Um, but uh, I'm willing to bet Joe's going to say it in the next question just to bail me out. Uh, but it is a very advanced unit that utilizes both that audio technology uh, from the past as well as uh, the, uh, it works on electromagnetic pickup uh, principle as well. And it's much more accurate um, for pinpointing uh, than the older uh, pure audio methods. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, as mentioned before, we're going over to Joe. Uh, Joe, how about electrical trim uh, through not yet fully matured, but an impending failure? All right, so uh, Glenn was uh, tongue-tied on the Digiphone, and uh, then you can also use a secondary uh, one as well for the ENT, for the voltage gradients method. But uh, referring to the uh, one Michael just talked about, uh, typically on this, if it's not failed yet, then you'll want to VLF to expand on the electrical trim. But what I mean by that is whenever you're doing a VLF test, this is kind of getting away from uh, cable fault locating and getting more into the uh, TND type uh, situations. So for testing and diagnostic. So uh, if you do, if you're concerned about let the electrical trim on your cable, then you'll want to do a TAN delta test, which will kind of give you some insight on the health status of your cable. And if you just do a VLF withstand test, it'll kind of give you a go, no go situation. So if you are worried about a service age cable with a high electrical train in it, and it does pass a uh, VLF withstand test for about 30 minutes for the maintenance intervals, uh, <clears throat> there it could give you a, uh, a good safe feeling that it shouldn't uh, fail within the next year or two. All right, thanks, Joe. Uh, back to Glenn. I have an easy thump. Why do I need an easy restore for residential ring testing? Um, so that's a, an interesting question. Uh, the easy thump has the same capability as the easy restore um, with the added benefit of having the uh, pinpointing uh, feature available for thumping. Um, but the advantage of the easy restore when we're talking about um, uh, residential ring testing is that it is much lighter and if uh, if this is if the crew that's going to be using it is just a power restoration crew and their whole goal is to just identify which section of cable needs to be isolated so that they can um, 
re-energize the rest of that, we'll say, neighborhood. Um, the Easy Restore is much lighter, um, and its its whole purpose in life is just to identify which section that you need to um, take out of uh, service for repair. And so that is truly the advantage, is, is it's much lighter, um, and you can, it's, it's a lot easier to uh, haul the Easy Restore into a backyard or uh, through the woods than it is to uh, take a larger unit. And so it's just um, a much more convenient uh, for cable or for power restoration teams. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, over to Joe. For TDR testing, is there a practical minimum distance for medium voltage cable? All right, so as far as the TDR goes, roughly about uh, 50 foot or so would be adequate for a TDR trace to actually locate the cables in. Depending on the TDR, you may be able to get smaller, but if you're trying to couple it with arc reflection, you'd want a lar longer cable, so something roughly about the 75 foot range for the arc to reflect to reflect back to give it enough uh, distance to actually help with the calculations. All right, uh, it looks like we got one more question we can get on with Jason. Uh, do you see any issues with introducing voltage for an arc reflection test through a transformer or through a series of transformers? Uh, the, initially, the answer to that is no, but uh, we have to understand what we're doing um, whenever we do an arc reflection. And as Glenn pointed out in his presentation, um, initially, you're going to do that first uh, low voltage CDR trace which is um, a low voltage, high frequency pulse. And then you're gonna follow that with the high voltage, high frequency pulse of the arc reflection. Um, and both of these will be um, sent in, if you will, uh, to the primary coil of the transformer. Um, and the primary coil uh, will basically act as a, a large inductive choke and um, for the high frequency pulses. Um, and so, what this means is that those high frequency pulses, uh, they're not going to excite the primary um, of the transformer, um, but rather pass it down the circuit. And that um, once it moves past it, uh, down the circuit, excuse me, um, it'll help our, excuse, it'll look for a path to ground to help you find the fault. Um, there, there are some, I guess, safety practices that you should follow whenever you are using the instrument or you are thumping or doing arc reflection when transformers are involved and um, that just that um, whenever you do proceed to tr uh, handle uh, the cable or do any work on the transformer uh, after doing this you need to make sure that you hang uh, grounds and follow all of the safety protocol um, of your company uh, to make sure that it is safe uh, after you have been applying those high voltage, uh, excuse me, applying high voltage into that inductive load. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, with that, it looks like that's all the time we have today for the live Q&A section. Uh, we apologize if we didn't get to your question uh, today, but we will be working to follow up with you offline uh, for the answers that you guys uh, need for a lot of these great questions. We got about half a dozen that we wish we could answer online. We just don't have the time here today. But as a reminder, uh, we will be sending out a copy of this presentation, a certificate of attendance, and a link to the recording of this webinar uh, in about two business days. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, as we conclude here, uh, please remember to answer our survey. That survey will include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you are interested, uh, and a field to let us know what, how we did and what topics we should cover in the future. Uh, but once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending, and I hope you all have a great weekend.